Hi. Last week, we did a video showing some of the things that you can do with a CO2 or dry ice fogger. Tonight what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some of the principles and the assembly of the actual machine. And then in the description below this video, I'm going to link to some PDF files that give the actual dimensions as well as the components that we used and links to the sources for the components. So by watching this video as well as taking a look at those files, you could have enough information to be able to reproduce what I did here. And if you want to modify it, you'll have a great starting point for anything that you want to build based on a machine that you know works. Now if you take a look at some of the earliest videos that we've done on this channel, I demonstrate some powerful laser projectors that I built for laser shows that we've done over the years, both in clubs and outdoors. And something that you learn early on is that a laser beam passing through perfectly clear air is invisible. You can't see it. And if you want to get that zzz, zzz, you know, Star Wars kind of look to the laser beams, you need particles or droplets in the air in order to be able to refract or reflect the beam. Now typically what's done is they use what's called either a fogger or a hazer, which is a hot source of tiny droplets that produce a very fine mist or fog in order to be able to reflect the beam. Now a more common commercial uh, consumer level device is usually based on glycerin, that's called a fogger. The higher end DJ type systems are often based on oil and that's called a hazer. In both cases though they produce droplets of an organic liquid that's been heated. And even though the liquid is heavier than air, the vapor that's coming out of there is pretty hot and so it tends to be neutrally buoyant. Consequently, it fills a room rel relatively homogeneously, and so the, the vapor will fill the room and there will be no sort of layering effect, which is good for a laser show. But if you want to control the vapor or control the fog and get more of a stratified appearance, a CO2 fogger is great because the fog that comes out of it tends to be heavy and hugs the ground. So if you want that river dance look or that dancing on the clouds type of an effect, this is a good alternative. It's a good complement to the typical fogger and hazer. Another disadvantage of these particular devices is because they're putting an organic vapor or uh, droplets into the air, eventually they will settle onto surfaces. Even though the glycerin based is water soluble, they will both make a sticky film that will get everywhere. It'll get on the floor, furniture, carpets. It's a mess. The advantage with the CO2 fogger is that it's pure water droplets that are producing the fog. So even though there is a little bit of an issue with that water, as I'll get to in just a little bit, nevertheless, you won't contaminate anything. So it's kind of another advantage. One of the sort of disadvantages is, is that it produces larger droplets, so they don't tend to have the same persistence. It doesn't last as long. But as a complement to the hazers and the foggers, it's a great tool to have if you're trying to produce that type of an effect. Now, anybody who's ever taken a Halloween party and put a punch bowl on the table and put some dry ice into it in order to produce fog, you actually are making a CO2 or dry ice fogger. One of the things that you'll notice is when you first put the ice into the water, you get a great fog and it looks really good. But then usually after a couple of minutes, you look at it and it's kind of feeble. Even though when you look around, you see that the ice is still there. The reason that happens is because the fog that comes off of these, these bowls is not actually the CO2. It's the condensed water droplets from the humidity that forms over the warm water as the ice cold CO2 that's sublimating off of the dry ice rises through it, it condenses the water droplets and so it's the water droplets you see. As the CO2 or the dry ice cools the liquid, the vapor pressure of the water vapor above the bowl decreases. There's less humidity to condense. And if you look inside, especially if you're using those larger chunks of dry ice, 
you'll actually get water ice shells that form around them, insulating them from the water, decreasing the sublimation rate, and again, making the output lower. That's why one of the big important things in these machines is you want a large quantity of very hot water to counteract that effect. And so heating is going to be an important feature. Another nice thing about using a machine, as opposed to say just a bowl of some hot water and some dry ice, is you can turn it on and turn it off, which is nice for a theatrical effect. Now, the system that I've used here is based on the core, which is a basket. Basically what this is, is it's a stainless steel basket that holds the dry ice. You can see it's pretty big. This is able to hold about 15 kilograms of dry ice, and you're going to need a lot. It goes through ice very quickly. To fill a room like this and maintain it through a production, you're going to need about 15 or 20 kilograms of dry ice. That's a lot. It's cheap, but keep that in mind when you buy it. You're going to need to be able to fill a basket like this, which can hold about 15 kilograms of dry ice. And the basket itself needs to have holes that allow the water and the dry ice to be able to interact. It needs to be strong and it needs to be something that you're going to be able to lift so it can't be so big that you can't manhandle it. This is a parts washing basket and new will cost you about $150. But you can get these used on eBay like I did for about $30. It came pretty nasty but after I cleaned off all the gunk it looks pretty good. It's strong, it has a good shape, and this size, which is 13 by 9 by 6 inches, is sufficient to be able to hold 15 kilograms of dry ice. If you can't get exactly this dimension, you may have to modify some of the dimensions I give you in the box, but this will determine what you're going to be using for the, the system. Now, in a typical commercial system, the cheap, the low-end systems, this thing will be raised and lowered into a reservoir of hot water by some pretty heavy duty levers. Those systems are, I think, a little bit less efficient because of the fact that you need pretty robust levers to lift up 15 kilograms of ice inside of the box. So you've got to be able to crank on it. They have to be built pretty strongly. In addition, this system here requires that you have to lift the basket out of the hot water and be able to lower it into the hot water, and so it makes the box itself larger for any given capacity. So what we decided to do is base this on a system like the high-end units, which is we pump hot water up through the uh, ice, and then we drizzle it down onto the dry ice and drop it through the dry ice. That's really nice because of the fact that the hot water is easy to manipulate. You can make it more compact and also gives us the ability of not having to manhandle this heavy basket full of ice. Now, if you look, I'll tip this down for the camera so that you can see this to make this easier. Inside of this box, you will see that there are two metal brackets in their L, um, L shapes out of aluminum that I milled a couple of notches in so that they will hold the bottom of the basket without it sliding around. And then they will also act to keep the heating elements that I'm using off the bottom of the box so if they get hot spots, they don't melt into the, the material of the box. It's a nice setup. You may have to modify this a little bit from my drawings, again, depending on the shape of the basket that you're using. But this isn't complicated. You can basically take a look at this and see what's necessary in order to be able to hold it up. Now, when this goes into the box, and you don't really necessarily have to see it. I'll show it to you a little bit later. What you're going to then end up doing is you're going to need to build the box. And as you can tell from here, from here, from the ultrasonic cleaners that I've got over there, I really like this PVC foam board. It's got a lot of advantages for this project. Probably the most important is it's cheap. It also is widely available. It is electrically and thermally insulating. It also takes glue well holds screws well, it is waterproof, and it's easy to machine. And if I didn't mention it's cheap, it's cheap. And it looks nice. It produces a nice finish, and it, it's just it's attractive. So I like using this. Now, anybody aware of PVC knows that PVC has a temperature rating. You're not supposed to use it over 60 degrees centigrade or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the issues there is that that temperature limit is based on structural integrity. If you have a pipe fitting, it's guaranteed to a certain pressure at that temperature. If you take 
boiling water here and you take some of this insulating foam board and you put it in the boiling water, it won't melt the, the foam board and it won't dissolve it. But what it will do is it will make it spongy. It'll make it weaker. Now you might think, well, then your box is going to fall apart. No, it doesn't because this stuff is such a good thermal insulator that the inside of the box may get soft, may get a little bit spongy. But by the time you get to the outside of the box, you can barely tell this is on, even if there's boiling hot water inside of it. So structurally, this is perfectly fine, even though the inside might get a little overheated because we're not using this at high pressure. So the PVC foam is an excellent material for this. And in addition to that, the fact that it tends to be light makes the box a little bit more mobile and easier to use. Now, as you can see, the way I fabricated this is I simply built a square box structure with these butt joints here. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there's actually two layers of the material on the bottom. I don't really need that for structural purposes, but I wanted a thicker piece of material so that the wheels that are put on the bottom, when I drive the screws into them, they don't have to penetrate the box and they have a little bit more material in order to bite into. So that's the reason for the doubling up. Nevertheless, it adds a little bit of weight and it also makes the box a little bit stiffer. And so that just makes things a little bit easier to move around. You need the wheels because with 20 kilograms of ice, 10 kilograms of water, the underlying structure of this box, you're talking about 40 plus kilograms, 90 plus pounds, you need wheels. You don't wanna be moving this thing around when this thing is completely loaded. As you can see, if you take a look at what happened here, this has basically you know, gotten like a dish sponge. It's pretty soft. It'll harden up and actually this is a nice way to be able to form this material in shapes if you ever wanna do that. But as you can see, this is certainly not something that you're going to want uh, to build a, a box out if you're going to heat both surfaces and the entire box is going to get hot. This is already starting to stiffen up. So again, a nice technique to have uh, in your repertoire. Now, if you look at the way that the box is set up, you'll see on the back surface, most of the action is happening. On the back of this box, I've hooked up a couple of these pumps. I really like these pumps. These are solar water heater pumps. We have about a dozen of them. I bought them for about $20 each uh, in quantity, but I think you can get these for about $28, $30 each on Amazon. They are submersible 12 volt pumps that are good up to 50 degrees centigrade submerged, but they will pump up to 100 degrees centigrade boiling hot water through here. And at less than an amp and 12 volts, they'll lift the water this high and move eight liters per minute per pump. So I have both pumps hooked up here to a 15 volt power supply. It's intermittent, it doesn't matter, it works fine at that slightly higher power level. But I get 10 liters out of each pump. So I pump 20 liters onto the dry ice every minute. So it's a lot of water. The module here that converts the line voltage into the 15 volts is then just interrupted on its positive side. So I have this little switch that allows me to turn the pumps on whenever I wanna pour hot water on Onto the, uh, onto the dry ice. The other thing that you'll see on the back here are these two large temperature controllers. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend using the heaters that I'm using for this simply because these are really high quality. I use them around the lab. I use these in order to heat the dye laser dyes for, for the laser system, so I had them. So for me, they were free. But if you wanted to buy these things new, they're about $130. So you might not want to go this way, even though it's convenient. It has a nice temperature controller and limiter. It's a nice setup, but nevertheless, you might want to try a different, uh, different method. The way that I put these in, if you do decide to go this way, is they have these long, Im totally immersible uh, heating elements. And what I'm going to do, you don't really have to look in the box until a little bit later. But I pass these through these large holes that are well above the water line, put them all the way through here like this. And then there is a protective sheath that goes on the outside of this, screws all the way down here like this onto this fine thread, a little bit like three days of the jackal. Get my sniper rifle ready. Tighten that up. And then I lay this across those two aluminum brackets down there. And I repeat the same action over on the other side. Put this one through here like this. Then I put these crosswise onto the bottom of the box like this. Then
there. And then with this small spring, I use this to be able to compel the two units to sit away from the edges here so that they don't touch. So there's nothing but metal or water that these two 1300 watt heaters contact. And then what I do is I fill this up with some water and put the basket on top of it. And this whole unit will take about 15 minutes, maybe 18 minutes to heat up eight liters of water. Right to the bottom of the basket. Then if you look back here one more time, you'll see that I've taken these stoppers, I've split them, and these stoppers go around the feeds. And then if I push these up into these large oversized holes, again, well above the water line, so we're not trying to get water tight. But what we are doing is we're sealing this up against any kind of spray that may occur from the pumps. Just give that a little push in there like that. It's tight and that way we don't get any water leakage. Now, as I said, one of the issues that you have with this is that these things are expensive. There's another alternative to this if it turns out that you want to build bigger units and you want to make this a lot cheaper. And that is a $10 hot water heater element. These come in 120 and 240 volt. They come all the way up to like five kilowatts per. And the system to, to get these things to fit in a box like this is this metal plate that you see that I fabricated here. Simply has a large diameter, one inch or two, I think it's about 28 millimeter hole. And then a little one inch pipe thread nut here with an O-ring on the outside. When you squeeze this down like this and then just drill an oversized hole inside of your box, you insert this in here like this, put some screws on here, a little bit of gasket sealant, and now you could just hook this up to your wall and for $10 and a cord, you got a 2000 watt heater. Now you could just do that. It, it's very cheap. One thing though is if you forget to heat, uh, fill this with water or it boils the water out, what will end up happening is you'll cause a fire. So you might want to have a controller and for this kind of power level, the best way to do that is to get a little cheap $8, either an Arduino or a little $8 temperature thermostat. It's a little DC voltage res, uh, relay based on a preset temperature that you can set for whatever temperature you like. It has a little probe that then can be adhered to the plate, which is in contact with the water. So if you run out of water or you boil it off or you didn't add it, this plate will almost immediately heat up from the heat of the element here and turn the unit off. Or you could preset it if you don't want to run at boiling temperatures, which would be the natural limiter if all you did is just took this up and let it boil. And then this little DC power supply powers a Crydom solid state relay. These come 120, 240 volt, all the way up to 100 amps. You could put 20 kilowatts through this little thing using this little controller. Cost you about $60, cost you about eight or nine dollars and basically you could put 10 kilowatts into a unit like this or you know a much much larger unit and heat is important because the hotter you can make the water and the hotter you can keep it the longer you can push out the smoke or the uh, the fog before the co2 or the dry ice has cooled it and you've lowered your your heating rate so now what i'm going to do is show you a little bit more about how the pumps are set up because i want to make sure that you have all the information not just overview not just theoretical the pumps go through a little penetration deep down, low, as low as I can get it, half inch hole with a half inch NPT tapered pipe thread here. With a little pipe thread tape on here, I screwed this in until it got tight. It does not leak. Even at boiling temperatures, that's fine. No gasket material, no lubricant. Then a simple female half inch over here to a large diameter hose barb and then soft silicone rubber tubing. Silicone rubber is nice because it's very good to high temperatures and it's very flexible despite the large diameter. And then at this end, I have a half inch NPT uh, uh, type of thread to the right angle hose barb. And then on the inside of the box, what I do is I take a Forstner bit and I drill about halfway through the material here, making this a little bit thinner. And then with a CPVC high temperature fitting and this threaded piece here, I simply screw the two things together and squeeze the box between these things as they tighten down. This gives me a nice fitting. And then I just have a friction fitting here into which I can put the nozzle. 
take a look at what happens here. One, two, three. Pretty good. Now one of the problems with this, as I'll show you, is if you put the basket in here and you center the basket and get it nice and leveled and it's, everything is all good, and then you hit the switch, you'll notice that all the water ends up in two tiny little beams. Problem with that is you're going to end up drilling holes through your dry ice and as soon as you get to the other side of it, you're not going to interact very well with the CO2. Now one of the things I tried to do is I replaced these simple 45 degree angles with something that I put some interrupters in, something to uh, cause the, the water to break up a little bit. So compared to the one on the right, I'm going to put this one in over here on the left, like that. And then you can see the difference in the effects on three. One, two, three. A little better spray, a little better distribution, but it still isn't good enough. So then what I elected to do is rather than using this or a cap with little holes drilled into it which restricts flow, I built this little tray. I'm going to show this to you over here. I'm going to come to the front and maybe this is the best way for me to show this to you. I took a piece of 22 gauge aluminum. You don't need any tools other than a vise and a pliers and a hammer. And I bent up the sides like this at a 90 degree angle to form a tray. And then in the open end, what I did is I cut a little notch, as you can see, and then bent it down to the bottom so that it acts as a standoff. And this sits on the top of the basket. And then the white is simply a piece of the PVC foam board that I cut and then I trimmed a little notch out here, again, to clear the handle on my particular cleaner. And then drilled four millimeter or 3 16 inch uh, diameter holes in a square pattern. And then putting this on top of the tray, I'll show this outside of the box so that you can see this a little bit better than inside the box, like this. This sits on top of the tray, and now when this fills up with water, you get a nice distribution of water all over the ice, and you consume it all from the top down. Now, because this box may not be on a level floor, or this thing might sit a little bit crooked, you don't want sheets of water to be pouring off one side as it sort of oozes out through the holes, it kind of drips down. So you can see on the bottom here, what I did is on the holes, I caused them to pucker so that each one of the holes bulges out and forms a little nozzle so that the water will actually drip from the location that it penetrates the holes. And the way I did that was actually very easy. I took the tray after the holes are drilled, put it on top of a piece of soft uh, styrofoam, then taking one of my armored balls for our body armor, glued it on the end of this hammer handle, and then just put it over each hole and tapped it with a hammer, causing the bulge. Whenever you cause a lot of dents on one side of a piece of sheet metal, it'll cause a concavity, a bowl shape. So then I simply turned it over, and between the holes, I put the ball down like this, gave it another tap, and ended up producing a grid of dents in this side, which then produces a very stiff layer. At the same time, it's flat, so that it sits nice on top of the box. This is very light because it's 22 gauge. It doesn't have a lot of thermal inertia, so that it gets cold on top of the ice. But when the hot water pours on it, it's not heating the aluminum before it drips through. This is very easy, very lightweight, very inexpensive, and you can do this pretty easily. But you may have to, again, modify the shape a little bit if you've got to fit around your particular basket with your particular handles. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put the basket in there with some ice. So I'm going to fill this up with some ice. I'm going to put the drip tray on top of here, and then we're going to move toward actually demonstrating the unit itself. This is called prill dry ice instead of the big chunks. And you can get it in all different shapes and sizes, but this I find the best because it seems to dissolve the fastest. It's got a great amount of surface area. Like I said, it'll take about 15 or 20 minutes. And something to keep in mind with this system is that because of the fact that you're drawing 1300 watts a circuit, generally speaking, you're going to need to use dual circuits unless you're doing your uh, unless you're doing your demonstration at a big facility that's got 220 volt high amperage lines or you know big phase current so that's why it's usually a good idea even if you have a high powered system to divide it up into more convenient systems so now what we're going to do is I'm going to add this to the top of the box like that 
And now I'm going to talk to you about the top. The top here is the same foam board. I just sort of butt glued these square frames around here so this sits inside of the box and tends to prevent spray so that we're not depending completely on the gasket because it gets pretty wet and a lot of spray going around on inside the box. You need the gasket because you do, do develop some pressure inside of there when it's brushing the smoke out. And if you don't seal this, you'll get sort of spritzes of smoke coming out of the sides. So this hollow tube, a little adhesive here, this shouldn't get wet so weather tight or weather quality is good enough for this. And then on the back surface, you can see the hinges, which are um, removable hinges. The pins actually come out, which is kind of nice because it makes it possible to be able to remove this. And then you'll also notice this lightweight PVC fitting that I have in here is located in a hole that I drilled with a hole saw, a little undersized, and just with five minutes of hand sanding and fitting, I get a friction fit with a typical four inch diameter PVC fitting. And then I made a ring in the bottom surface like this, hole saw, second hole saw, too small, that forms a little ridge here as the bottom of the pipe. So when I put the pipe in by just forcing it in, it doesn't keep just dropping through, makes it a nice fit. So then when I put the hinges on, I simply have to line this up like this. And this is sometimes a little tricky if I'm in a hurry, but it's usually not too bad. And you get the two holes in there like this. Taking the lid off as opposed to a permanent hinge makes it a little easier just to mess around with it, but it's not really necessary. It's probably overkill. And then when you drop this thing down with these little eyelets on either side, I then end up using this little hook and I can put a little pressure on here and force against the gasket. This gives me a, an airtight seal on each side. And then we're just gonna let this heat up for a little bit. So give me 15 minutes, we'll get this thing up to temperature and then I'm gonna demonstrate how this works. See you in a sec. All right, we're good. It's been about 15 minutes. The more heat you use, the faster this thing will heat up and reheat, but 2600 watts, 10 liters, gets you to about boiling in about 15 minutes. So on five, four, three, two, one. See ya. Off. Now it takes a little bit of time to dry off, uh, die off as the uh, water filters through the dry ice. But eventually this will go down to just seeping out a little bit in about a minute. But you get a lot of fog and you can see it affects the floor and you get this kind of nice spooky look down here. And if you put lighting down here, it's kind of nice to actually have low level lighting that lights the fog differentially. It tends to make the fog look even richer, even though it isn't richer. Ready? Let's give it another pulse. It makes you want to dance, doesn't it? Now, one of the things that you'll find with this is that sometimes you want to put this back where nobody can see it and then be able to get the smoke into a certain area, get the fog into a certain area. So that's the nice thing about having this press fit connection is you can then put a fit connection with some dryer hose, aluminum wire with some plastic material, and this will allow you to route the smoke to another location this and that way you can hide this behind some chairs or underneath a table and that's kind of a nice feature. Ready? That way nobody knows what's going on. You want to see this? And you can have fun with it too. Hmm. Smells like I'm inside of some ginger ale. But it's perfectly breathable. 
Now, something to keep in mind with this, uh, with this smoke is, as I said, it doesn't leave any kind of a contaminating film behind. But one of the things that it does do is it leaves water behind. So if you're going to do this in a uh, facility that has, say, tile or marble floors, and say the, the newlywed couple has finished their dance, quickly you want to take some towels and you want to wipe this up so that people don't slip because there is water. This does put out a fair amount of water that will deposit on the floor. So for safety reasons, just keep that in mind. But again, it's clean and there's no aroma. There's no odor left behind. So it's kind of nice. Now, as I said, check out the description below because I'll give you all the information about the, uh, the drawings and the, uh, the dimensions and the components. And in addition to that, uh, if you have a question about uh, what I've done or if there's something that I didn't cover in enough detail for you, give me a comment. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a comment. I read them all and I'll try to answer your questions and make sure that if you do decide to build this, it's going to be a success. If you like that, what we're doing here, please subscribe to the channel because it does help. It uh, helps us to grow, helps us to spread what we're doing to a wider audience. And if you do give us a comment and you do give us a thumbs up, that again gives YouTube a better reason to try to promote what we're doing. Finally, if you spread this information around to people that you think might find this valuable, that also helps because it brings in new people who might not be aware that science like this doesn't always have to be high tech and, uh, and difficult and uh, electronic based. It can be pretty much just an assembly and some engineering. So I want to thank you very much for watching. This is a great project. It's a lot of fun. And I'm, going to, I'm thinking right now about a few ways that we're going to be able to use this. You take care. You have a great evening. And thanks for watching.